Okay, welcome along to another law video. Let's start by getting the bad news out of the way because it's been done to death and I don't want to dwell on it for too long. And at the end of the day, it will get sorted somehow and moves in that direction have already been made. So it's a hammer blow, but it's not the end of the world. So we'll take a quick look at what's happened and then move on. So some of you may have heard about the riot that followed the announcement about how systems are saved or lost. After 10 days of people killing Thargoids, doing rescues and delivering goods to save the systems under attack, FDEV dropped a bombshell on us and said that if we didn't do enough work to move the progress bar for a system all the way over in a week, our progress would be reset as if it hadn't happened. So when the timer says four weeks or six weeks or whatever until the next system state, basically that means you get that many chances to get the progress bar all the way over in seven days. Except there was also a bug with the timer where it was counting down by one week every day. So instead of the four weeks we at the PDES should have had to save our target system, Matt Shiru, and instead of the four attempts we should have had, the timer ran down during the week and the system was lost anyway. And all the other systems advanced as well to the next stage towards Thargoid control. Um, stations that were active and unattacked became attacked. Stations that were attacked became damaged and classed as inactive. Stations which were previously damaged were gone. All of the systems are updated at Thursday morning maintenance schedule. So that is still Tharg's day. Deleting player progress is the worst thing you can do. As Obsidian Ant and others have said, this is Game Design 101. It's like assaulting the referee in football or hitting your teammate in Formula One. It's a cardinal sin, it's a huge no-no, and you just don't do it. So I'm not going to excuse that, because there is no excuse for it. But what I will say is that although this silly reset thing still exists for the moment, FDEV at least did do something about our ability to change system states. And so the day after the announcement about the reset, Friday, they dropped the targets behind the scenes so that they were actually achievable. People noticed that the progress bar was moving significantly faster throughout Friday evening, and we were watching it as well, with our resident analyst, Commander Lupus, running the numbers. There are too many variables to be completely accurate about the time taken to do missions because an extra minute taken to dock here, problems logging into the mission board there, things like this make exact mission timing impossible to nail down, but we don't need to. The effort needed to move the progress bar is always the same regardless of the time it takes, so the only thing time controls is how fast it happens. Once we realised we didn't have to accurately predict that, to produce a working model, Lupus was able to put together a picture of how much effort it takes to move the progress bar, and we're at the point where we, we can, with a very small and understood margin for error, determine the amount of effort that can be done in an hour or a day, a week, and so on. It will be a useful tool, which is a work in progress, and the intention is when we're satisfied it's as accurate as we can make it, it's our intention to share it with AXI, Ida, Burpit, and probably anybody else who wants it. So by Friday night, we were able to say to groups like Operation Ida, who'd understandably halted operations until something was done to give us a chance, we were able to say, oh, heads up, guys, they've obviously changed the targets, and we've got the data to prove it, so don't lose hope yet. And over the weekend, AXI, Ida, and ourselves came together with a realistic chance to save... HIP 23716. We'll go into that later when we take a look at the war. In as much as it is possible to put a positive spin on this, it could be seen as a bit of a backhanded compliment. In the past, FDEV have set us targets thinking we wouldn't hit them, and we've not just hit them, we've annihilated them. So in a way, it could be seen as a form of flattery, even though it doesn't come across that way, it shows how worried we make them that they feel the need to go to such drastic measures to slow us down. It doesn't make how they did it any better, but it's a thought. Either way, let's not allow one daft decision to get in the way of the potential of this new war machine to involve every kind of player 
from combat jock to rescuers and space truckers, and with the potential to tie in lots of good storylines along the way. Let's keep our eyes on the prize. I want to do a quick catch-up of the associated lore before taking a further look at how we turn the system away from being Thargoid controlled and towards post-Thargoid recovery. All eight Stargoids are now here, so we have a good picture of the work needed to clear them all and it is phenomenal. Canon at one point estimated it could take two to three years to do it and that's just the work needed to regain control of all the invaded, alert and already controlled systems and that doesn't include whatever we need to do about the maelstroms. Sirius are selling extra ammo heatsinks on their megaships which have five shots per heatsink and you can unlock them with materials and goods. Three community goals have been running to give us the enhanced anti-xeno multi-cannons and missiles and now, the one that many of us have been waiting for for a while, the gimbaled versions of the multi-cannons is running right now. That'll be a nice Christmas present if it gets completed in time. Most of the Galnet articles have been light on detail and not as frequent probably giving us a couple of weeks to get our heads around this new war machine, but now they're coming back more frequently. That doesn't mean they're not worth reading, there's some good writing in there, they just don't really give us a lot to work with. Uh, Dalton Chase says uh, Kingfisher was a mistake, and so was working with the Thargoid Advocacy Project because they are inexperienced and also civilians. Both of these reasons ring false to me. Who is experienced against this new threat? Nobody. And as for getting the Federal Navy involved, which Dalton is asking for, if this attack has shown us anything, it's that the posturing of all the superpowers has been hot air. None of them have a clue, none of them have a plan, and they never did. They're all in headless chicken mode and about as much use as a chocolate fireguard. People like Petraeus are particularly quiet after all his big talk about having the situation contained. Chase's political opponents have their knives out for him because there's nothing like perspective, and that's nothing like perspective. And what's left of the Thargoid Advocacy Project says the superpowers are still accountable for causing this whole mess in the first place by supporting salvation. It's now obvious that the Kingfisher or any other attempt to communicate was never going to work, and it looks like D2, or as we now know her, Shojin A, she was right, and nothing could or did stop this war machine arriving. It's a direct reaction to the Proteus wave event and nothing anyone did was going to change their response. Not that this is any consolation to the poor people of the Kingfisher, but at least they didn't get destroyed for doing anything actually wrong as such, because the Thargoids had already decided they weren't listening. Thargoid sensors were found on the wreckage on the Kingfisher in the cargo hold and some players thought, oh, sabotage while well, others thought these sensors can be part of the random cargo on any mega ship, no need to read anything into this. And the debate between the players, though, obviously captured FDev's imagination because they released this article, which made me laugh, because it's basically saying, you know, all of you who thought it was sabotage, did you ever consider it might have just been some well-meaning idiot thinking it would attract the Thargoids so they could talk and not knowing how hostile they would be? Did it occur to you that it might be all innocent? No? Dear dear, what suspicious minds you all have. But they also haven't ruled out that it might be something more sinister, so they are free to take that story any direction that they want, really, and we'll have to see if they do. But this is a great example of taking something from the players back into the story and weaving it in, which is always nice to see. Now let's take a look at what's been happening in the war itself. After everybody had calmed down a bit and some people thought, well, if we can't change anything yet, let's use that time to experiment until they give us a chance by doing some different jobs in different systems to see what effect they had. So we all started experimenting. AXI chose to do rescues and only rescues in an alert system, HIP 2485, and sent any of their crew who wanted to fight instead to HIP 23716. We stayed in HIP 23716, but because the main station, Wakata, had now come under attack due to the buggy timer, and because we had a lot of new people, 
We sent the new ones to help out AXI where hopefully the rescues would be safer until they got some money and experience behind them and maybe some engineering done. And then that way we would all be doing either one system or the other. So it's been a hectic and stressful but also a fun time. I spent the last fortnight desperately trying to find out everything I can as fast as possible about the war machine and the rescue process in particular because of all the people asking how do we do them, what do I need, have you got any starter builds and since I've had as much time to get used to the new situation as anybody else I've been having to say things like I'm on it, bear with me, it's only been a few days, we're all in the same boat working it out as we go along, give me a couple of days and I'll have something, if you've got any information I can use give it to me and perhaps I can do that faster. Fortunately it didn't take too long, although rescues have changed, what's needed to do them is pretty straightforward and a lot less specialised as it used to be, so it's been easier and faster to work out, and in all likelihood most people wanting to do rescues or deliveries will probably be able to do them with a ship that they already have, or one they can buy cheaply, and the engineering is mostly what people do already as well. If you're completely new, an unengineered Cobra Mark III is perfect as a low risk starter ship. It's got the speed without engineering. It can be used to take small passenger missions for two and a half to four million each until you've got some money behind you. The first successful mission will get you several rebuys and the material wards are all high level materials for trading and engineering. So although I miss my beloved cold running Corvette the Ferrari fridge, and I still feel like consigning them to a fresh and new circle of hell for making me use an anaconda. The fact is that rescues are now open to everyone and anyone to pick up and do with minimal outlay and no engineering and that is long overdue. Also instead of all these tasks only being available periodically, well you can always go and do AX, you can go and find Thargoids any time in non-human signal sources but rescues and deliveries were only ever needed for burning stations and they weren't around all the time, months could go by without any. Instead of that, now all of the aspects of the war machine are available to all types of player all of the time and to me that is where the potential becomes really interesting because for the first time we have an ongoing war situation with the possibility of developing long-term strategies to deal with it. And that's a whole new level of creativity for a player base just itching for the chance. So despite a bit of a false start, the potential is there for the ongoing conflict to be as bold and interesting as the setup was. There's still a lot to learn about these new stages in the attack cycle for a system, the maelstroms, the different actions that work best depending on the state, and so on, and as I said in my last video, we're going to have to see some of these states play out first before we can fully comprehend all the effects and perhaps the knock-on effects that they have. We have learned a few things though. We know that the term inactive port refers to a station's ability to take deliveries, its ability to function as a port in the literal sense of the word to exchange and trade goods. It doesn't mean the station's gone completely. Not if you can restore it fast enough. When a system gets attacked, the first thing to go is a commodity market. The next thing to go is deliveries. So active in this sense means its literal ability to function as a port, but there is still evacuate the wounded missions there. There are still passenger missions there. And rescuing it becomes more vital than ever if you don't want that port to become abandoned. We've also validated the statement by Burr in one of his recent videos where he said doing rescues in alert systems would be considered preemptive and less effective than doing rescues in attacked systems. From the testing done by AXI we've seen that well they don't do nothing but the progress bar moves about three times slower than it would in an attacked system. Therefore, delivering supplies to alert systems is a better choice and a more logical one. You know, in a real war, you would evacuate some people, but not the whole system. And then bolstering the defences so that they can fight off the invasion 
is what you'd be doing rather than pulling people out who would either be defending it or maintaining the infrastructure so that others can you know get the sick and vulnerable and so forth out of the way but then everybody else would be manning the guns or making sure those manning the guns had everything they needed and bringing in supplies and so that does seem to work better in an alert system than rescues we showed that as in Machiru where we showed that once the evacuate wounded missions go down to evacuate critically wounded they are then the most important mission to do at that port and so that tells us that targeted action works as well as and in certain situations may even work better than throwing people at a system with a focus spread over every task and mission if that targeted action can then have more people doing it so much the better a tactic either works or it doesn't to what extent is secondary to that the numbers just make it work faster some people speculated that there may be an activity cap or player cap as there is in the BGS but this is highly unlikely given the effort needed to move just one progress bar in a week it would be completely illogical to put a cap on the activity needed to do it and there is no evidence to suggest that any kind of limit exists unlike the regular BGS you cannot do too much in a system you either do enough to get the bar across in a week or you don't there have been a lot of misconceptions about the war machine and every single misconception is based on comparing it to the regular BGS level caps diminishing returns all of it we need to get away from this line of thinking because it's holding us back understand the war machine for what it is and stop constantly comparing it to what it isn't free your mind and the rest will follow we completed both systems HIP 23716 and HIP 24A5 returning both of them to human control and with a lot of repair work needed in 23716 people like Ida may or may not get on this after doing the latest community goal because it's absolutely their domain and also hunting orbital truckers and other such groups could get it on it as well uh, let's see what happens next week if we get a decent repair effort then we'll see what happens at the next Thursday morning maintenance and hopefully the recovery of HIP 23716 will continue and HIP 2485 will remain in human control and uh, not be reinvaded but we actually have no idea of course which is what makes all this so exciting having booted the Thargoids out of a system could they come back to that same system again we don't know yet all sorts of things we don't know yet so what can you do except the job in front of you and see what happens next attention is split at the moment with an alert system and an attack system being focused on by AXI and ourselves and I don't want these videos to be a blow-by-blow -blow account of the war because I think that would get boring fast so I'll probably summarize these in future and say this system got attacked and this one came out of alert and this one did something else but for the moment it's all new and we are still exploring the mechanics and hopefully new or returning players may find some of this information here useful to answer some questions the biggest one possibly being so where did this massive war suddenly come from we still don't know where the stargoids and even the regular thargoids come from at the moment but we sure as hell know where they are right now in our faces challenging us to take them on or die now whether that's by direct combat rescues or delivering supplies it's all still reactive at the moment but in time perhaps we will start developing wider strategies to give us an edge in this war I'm gonna do another video probably over the weekend because like last year with the winking cat after ever giving out some Christmas goodies for simply decoding a few simple messages and visiting a few places I will run through all of these and then go and pick them all up so if you missed out on getting things like the festive flat cannons and other fun toys last year watch out for that one coming over the weekend meanwhile as always thanks for watching thanks for listening keep up the good fight and remember every system we neglect will fall to the enemy so the message is eternal vigilance look after yourselves out there